When I retired, I uploaded as many of my publications as I could to ResearchGate so they might be available to future researchers. So far, there have been over 3,000 reads, and well over 700 of them are for the editorial I wrote in June 2013, with this title, Design Epistemology and Curriculum Planning. So it's clearly an important topic for many researchers. The editorial had been written for Design and Technology Education, an international journal, and in response to a report prepared by an expert panel concerning the national curriculum in England and Wales. The major concern was that the expert panel concluded that design and technology did not provide a powerful way of engaging with the future. How could this be when that is in essence its reason for existing? Design concerns the modelling of future possibilities and the implementation of those possibilities considered worth pursuing. And so in 2017, Loughborough Design Press published an exploratory book with the same title. Colleagues were invited to give their views in relation to the 2013 editorial and the expert panel's report. Stephanie Atkinson, Alison Hardy, Steve Curl, Graham Newman, Tristram Shepard and David Spenlove all made important contributions. In his contribution, David Spenlove called for a new vision for design and technology education based on design thinking. Design and or technology too. He wrote as follows. There is therefore a unique, perhaps once in a decade, opportunity for reorientation of the values that were instrumental within the development of design and technology through adopting and capitalising upon the intellectual and reflective aspects of design thinking and revisioning them within design and or technology too. Tony Ryan, the Chief Executive of the Design and Technology Association, in his recent editorial, The D&T Practice, seemed to be suggesting that this task had largely been completed when he stated that, What I will say is this new GCSE is the award that should have been in place years ago. It's academically demanding, challenges students to develop their subject knowledge, while at the same time working on a set of skills and attributes that, once learned and mastered, will stay with them and serve them throughout their lives, and accurately mirrors the design thinking that takes place in business, industry, and indeed in life. Well, I hope that is true, but it could be that it's more of an aspirational statement than a reflection of current realities. In October 2018, the Design and Technology Association, in conjunction with the All-Party Parliamentary Design and Innovation Group and the Design Business Association, launched their report entitled Design Skills and UK's Industrial Strategy. As reported in D&T practice, it hinted at some of the complications that accurately reflecting design thinking entails. Design is a way of looking at problems and finding solutions. The government should incorporate it into all other subjects, ranging from programming to ethics. There is an acknowledgement here that design thinking is cross-curricular. Clearly design and technology embodies aspects of design thinking, but so do other subjects, and there is some tricky teasing out to be done before there can be any certainty that design thinking is being accurately reflected by the educational provision across the curriculum. And all this rather assumes that an audit of design thinking is actually a current possibility. I retired in 2012, and in that year a book was published called Articulating Design Thinking, edited by Paul Rogers, that reported on a recent conference. My reading was a little sketchy, as you might expect, towards the end of a career, but I don't believe that the problem of articulating design thinking had been resolved at that point. My last task at Loughborough Design School was to co-supervise a PhD by Arthur Chan, which has set out to establish the meaning of design thinking as expressed by academics and practitioners. There were many interesting outcomes, but that did not resolve the matter either. One of the targets of that PhD programme was the development of appropriate audit tools in relation to design thinking, but as I remember the situation, there was some way to go. Perhaps satisfactory audit tools have now been developed for design thinking, and they would certainly be needed for curriculum planning and review. The reasons for these appeals to design thinking as underpinning future curriculum development relating to design education are in a sense self-evident but can anyone actually explain clearly what they mean? Design and technology is so often presented as a process-driven subject that draws on the knowledge base developed in other curriculum areas that has come to be seen as of secondary importance, almost by definition. It's hard to complain about the conclusion the expert panel reached that design and technology should not be part of the core curriculum if its major epistemological focus is repeatedly claimed to be applying what is learnt in other subjects. This all gets a little easier to grapple with if modelling is chosen as the point of departure for analysis rather than referencing a or the 
design process or processes. The fundamental role of modelling and its relationships to designing and graphics need to be understood. The human capability to create and use mental models to act on the world and imagine future possibilities to design was at the heart of Ken Baines's seminal book, Design Models of Change, the impact of designly thinking on people's lives and the environment. Ensuring its publication was a key reason for the establishment of Loughborough Design Press. The seminars that led to this book provided the backdrop to the work of the PhD research students who were members of the Design Education Research Group towards the end of my full-time academic career. Xenia Danas and Chen Subei were both working on research related to graphicacy, although in very different areas. Xenia's research concerned the development of graphicacy within the school curriculum, and Sue's research concerned the visual communication of technology. The image shown here developed from discussions of their PhD programmes. Although they are directly related, modelling is a more general and substantial human capability than designing. Models can find expression in a variety of ways, for example through numeracy, literacy, graphicacy and articulacy, and they exist in the human mind in forms that researchers are still in the process of understanding. These relationships are key to understanding how design thinking will map onto most, if not all, areas of the curriculum, and not exclusively onto design and technology. They also shed light on ways in which technology can be viewed and represented. Scientists may well view technology as applied science and seek to represent aspects of technology, in particular mathematical-based symbol systems, but it may not be viewed in the same way by designers. René Magritte's Ceci n'est pas un pipe made the point that a representation is not the real thing, but from the modelling perspective, it is what that representation enables that is significant. Visual representation facilitates the imagination and the interaction with visual languages, as Ken Baines has described. Ken identified three visual languages. Visual or spatial qualities, such as colour, texture and proportion. Physical places, things and communications, such as landscapes, clothes and graphic images. And human values and meanings, such as beautiful, fashionable and green. Visual representation also facilitates analysis through the creation of diagrams that can help understanding and establish order. Technical drawings can also help with quantitative analysis and it is apparent why visual representations are a key aspect of modelling in the context of designing. In fact, the power of visual representations has grown ever greater with the increasing sophistication of data representation that modern information technology has made possible. Such data representations are already blurring the boundaries between visual and mathematical representations of models. The computer, of course, holds the data numerically. Traditionally, mathematical modelling might have represented a model as a series of equations that enable calculations and forecasts to be performed. I first came across complex mathematical models when I was introduced to the Club of Rome's report, The Limits of Growth, when studying engineering and economics at university. This provided a world model looking at such factors as resources, pollution, industrial output and population, and enabled predictions to be made which are well known to have been alarming, but have not had the impacts on behaviours that its authors might have hoped for. Nevertheless, the key point here is that the model enabled the predictions to be made and considered. It's not always understood that a product design specification, or PDS, is a model for a design, however it is useful to think about a PDS in this way. Within a PDS, it's possible to express both the aspirations for a design and the constraints on it. Through language, they can be expressed in a way that allows considerable interpretation, or indeed very little, but a numerical value is likely to provide a much more precise requirement. Even if a mood board was included in the specification in order to capture aspects that are difficult to express in words or numbers, for example, colours or styles, then I would suggest that the visual representation provides tighter limits on the design than a verbal statement might. So a model of design in written language can capture user or market requirements without unduly limiting the designer. This is almost certainly why the creation of a PDS and the use of freehand sketching are common early modelling activities when designing because they allow the ambiguity that is necessary in order to explore a design task. If this discussion is extended to embrace the concept of technology, then from a design perspective, the form in which technology is presented enables different kinds of exploration through modelling. 
the technology concept may be fixed, as in the example of a circle shown here, but the way it is presented will alter the design modelling that can be undertaken. I was honoured to be invited to give the John Eggleston Memorial Lecture in 2006, and I included reference to the survey conducted for the APU in 1983 concerning the contributions made by UK school subjects to technological understanding. As can be seen from the figure, technological understanding was subdivided into knowledge, skills and values, and several categories were identified under each heading. I remember one delegate saying that she thought it was rubbish the first time she saw it, or something very similar. It was a long time ago. I'm not sure of the methodology that the APU adopted, and I must look back and find out. But crucially, it showed recognition that technological understanding was not confined within a particular subject boundary. The Knowledge, Skills and Values Framework was used by the APU in their key document published in 1982 concerning understanding design and technology, which reported the work of the APU Technology Subgroup chaired by George Hicks. It remains a very interesting read and its appendix begins to explore the knowledge and skills embodied in an aerial photography project. I joined Loughborough University in 1984 and this was part of my background reading when I was reflecting on the nature of technology for design, or more fully, technology for the purposes of those engaged in designing. This conceptualisation of technology for design was always part of my thinking, and I eventually published a paper in 1998 considering whether it might provide a route towards more generalised positions concerning technology for design. The intention was not to consider technology in general as trying to generalise too far seemed likely to defeat any hope of reaching a consensus. But it was a model that had gained some traction both in my own research and in framing theoretical discussions with my research students. The survey outcomes shown here are important because they indicate a model of the contributions the different subjects were found to have made to understanding technology. Something similar is going to be needed to audit the contributions different subjects make to design thinking. And maybe there are some useful starting points here towards that cause as well. Clearly I'd already formed many preconceptions concerning design epistemology before I read the expert panel's report, but doing so certainly focused my mind. It was disturbing and it was apparent that despite the wide recognition of the value of design education within higher education, it was not recognised as being a central concern for general education. The often expressed idea that for the design field the knowledge that might be drawn upon is unbounded can lead to the lazy assumptions that designing is a process-based activity that draws its knowledge from other fields, and hence that it does not have its own epistemology. Although there are aspects of that position that are credible, I never supported it as an adequate description of design activities. This is what I wrote in 1998. Individual designers operate within a particular design area, and it is possible from the design activities in that area and its products to identify knowledge, skills and values which it might prove helpful for the individual designer to acquire. This is not a causal relationship, i.e. the acquisition of these knowledge, skills and values will not guarantee the designer success, neither is it an exact relationship. There is no guarantee that for a particular project the designer might not, might not need to acquire further knowledge, skills or values. Knowledge, skills and values so identified represent common elements associated with the range of activities and products studied. It's not an irreducible minimum in the sense that each element occurs in each activity and product. They're likely to be more disparate than that. They are elements that are associated reasonably frequently with activities or products in a particular design area. This is the essence of the difficulty faced by all those charged with the task of determining design curricula. Design curricula in higher education offers them focus on a more tightly defined design area than those in general education, and it would seem to me that this is the underlying reason that it's more possible to establish a consensus on which their curricula can be built. I've also had personal experience of different ways of knowing. I've worked as a research engineer at the Welding Institute, and each project was undertaken by a research engineer with an academic background like mine, I would studied engineering as an undergraduate and welding technology as a postgraduate and a welding engineer who had served a full apprenticeship. It was quite apparent to both me and, and presumably the management who provided the working structures within the organisation that these different ways of knowing led to different ways of thinking about a problem. I had also been working on the Polymer Guitar Project and I was fully aware that Rob Armstrong had made six or seven hundred guitars at that point 
and now over 900, essentially all different and all successful. He knew exactly what he was doing and was able to advise us on the polymer guitar project concerning such matters as material selection and strut patterns based on his wealth of experience. I recognised in Rob's practice what others have called purposive pattern recognition. Rob Armstrong clearly fully understood technology for guitar design, although he might not be able to articulate in the manner that a scientist might expect. The 2013 editorial was founded on three elements. The 1982 APU report on understanding design and technology, Vincenti's analysis of technology for the purposes of aeronautical design, and as Ken Baines reminded me, the work of Vitruvius concerning Roman architecture. Design and technology in general education had always been based on designing within selected design areas and with associated curriculum development projects. It had developed into a very important set of learning experiences for children, but it would always struggle to, deter to demonstrate disciplinary coherence unless the underlying reasons for having to select particular design areas was properly understood. As I wrote in the editorial, a curriculum derived from the lobbying conducted by special interest groups and selective curriculum development projects tends to be something of a patchwork and lacks a core disciplinary strand. When it comes under challenge, there is a serious risk of fragmentation and the whole looking rather less than the sum of the parts. And at least to some extent, that is the position that design and technology in the English national curriculum now finds itself. As design and technology always offered a selected range of design experiences, it would always be contested, and rightly so. That is what helped to keep it refreshed and relevant for many years, as changes occurred to the design world and the technologies available to it. Such a curriculum construct was a healthy enough position and didn't have the risks associated with adopting a more generalised experience of design education. The move towards a single GCSE curriculum has provided an opportunity to demonstrate that much has been learned about offering children design context to explore since the previous attempt in 1990. Having just helped to complete an A-level textbook, Advanced Design and Technology, in 1989, I was in the process of resetting my research targets when two interesting offers came along. The first was from curriculum videos who were based at Aberystwyth University and were looking for authors for video scripts to support the introduction of the new subject, Design and Technology, in the National Curriculum. With Steve Garner, a colleague in the Department of Design and Technology at Loughborough, we wrote the scripts and supported the editing for six video programmes to help bring the then new design context into the classroom. These were the home, the school, recreation, the community and business and, and industry. And together with an introduction, the six programmes focused on identifying design opportunities. The programmes were completed in 1991 and sold around 400 copies. Regrettably, the curriculum they supported was abandoned in 1992 and we never had the chance to evaluate the effectiveness of this strategy. There was an inevitable concern that children could identify design opportunities that were difficult for them to pursue and for teachers to support within the existing physical and educational constraints. Consequently, when I was approached by Longman to see if I had any ideas on publications that might support the introduction of design and technology into the national curriculum, I sought to collaborate with Leicestershire advisory teachers on a book that explored Leicestershire's approach to design education. I was aware that under the leadership of Andrew Fairborn as the Director of Education, Leicestershire had developed broadly based design facilities and associated strategies for teaching and learning that might offer some support due to the new approaches being pursued nationally. Regrettably, this book was no more successful than the videos, and so in my view they were worthy efforts to support the challenging strategy that had been adopted for design and technology in the 1990 national curriculum, but not significant enough to have any impact in resolving the difficulties that had resulted from the new curriculum. Allowing students in schools and colleges to pursue a variety of design contexts gives a seemingly immediate boost to the subject's relevance, but there are major management challenges associated with such strategies. It's important that a design project that is to be part of a student's assessments provides the opportunities for them to demonstrate what they're able to do and not simply expose what they cannot. I led the final year design projects at Loughborough University for five years and this was always the essential concern. Advising students on their project ideas was not so much about restricting their choices as helping them to identify opportunities to show their talents and with manageable risks perhaps considering different endpoints to manage the risk of running out of time. 
different prototyping strategies to avoid excessive costs if sponsorship could not be found, or different modelling techniques that could bypass difficult technologies if necessary. It seems highly likely that these are the same kind of conversations that teachers will be holding with their students as they tackle the new GCSE context. Underpinning all these conversations is design epistemology. What is it that designers need to know and how do they know it? As designers take on a new design area, there can be a rapid learning curve to be surmounted within the project time frame, and it's no different for students. Teachers will be making judgments about their students' starting points and their likelihood of getting to where they need to be as they advise students on their projects. I've seen advertising materials from the Design and Technology Association for CPD programmes that have been designed to tackle these issues. So hopefully this initiative will have more longevity than its predecessor in 1990. But the poor articulation of design epistemology remains a major stumbling block. Design educators should by now have reached a consensus and be able to audit design thinking across a curriculum and articulate design epistemology for particular design areas and more generally. But I don't think that is the position we are in. Consequently, in 2017, Loughborough Design Press published some initial explorations of design epistemology and curriculum planning. Colleagues were asked to consider what their response might have been to the expert panel's conclusions and the circumstances that could have led to them. These were published alongside the original editorial in an effort to set out the issues. This book was not about trying to provide answers or even to consolidate different perspectives, but to open the potential for debate and for further contributions to be made. However, it was decided that one further matter deserved to be included, epistemology and visual thinking. Discussions of epistemology are usually restricted to those matters that can be expressed in the conventional symbol systems associated with written languages or mathematics. It seems apparent that this can never be sufficient for design epistemology, where some matters can only be articulated through visual languages, making meaning without words. It's also well known that much design modelling takes place through visual methods in both two and three dimensions, and that some aspects of design languages can only be expressed visually. And so Ken Baines published his cartoon-style drawings, revealing aspects of making meaning without words. It seemed the most appropriate way to make the point. It also seemed appropriate to emphasise the cross-curricular nature of modelling through images by including a section on Xenio Danos' work on graphicacy. Numeracy, literacy and articulacy have been much discussed and analysed, but comparatively little effort has been made to structure the teaching and learning of graphicacy across the curriculum. Xenia's work shows one way in which this could be pursued, and if the full nature of design thinking across the curriculum is going to be articulated and audited, then its relationship to a taxonomy of graphicacy across the curriculum is going to play some part. Just one of Ken's ten cartoon-style drawings is shown here, and just one category from Danos' taxonomy. Danos' taxonomy is an update of much earlier work by Fry in 1981. The update was necessary because as times have moved on, the internet has emerged, computer drawing tools have become more common in schools, and the nature of drawing within the school curriculum provision has changed with the additional use of colour, photographic and 3D images, to name a few. This illustrates the additional complication that design epistemology is a moving target, and both what designers need to know and how they know it will change. Designers work within and are products of their culture. They acquire knowledge from that culture and work with technologies which embody the accumulated knowledge of their society. So the challenge is to identify common elements from different times and cultures, as well as those that depend on particular circumstances. This does appear to be problematic, but it is the kind of research that will shed light on the human capability to design, the part it has played in human evolution and the ways in which the changes in human culture have influenced this capability. Graphicacy only reflects one aspect of the human capability design, but analysing the differences between Fry's and Danos' taxonomies will bring out some of the ways that graphicacy has developed in the last 30 years or so. Of course this would only be a small step, and exploring the relationship between graphicacy and designing is not a straightforward matter either, but all journeys begin with small steps. The important matter is to take a step in the right direction.